If you would like to earn CPE credit for listening to the show, visit earmarkcpe.com backslash FPA. Download the app, take a short quiz, and get your CPE certificate. If you would like to earn continuing education credit for your FP&A certification from the Association of Finance Professionals for listening to the show, go to the show notes for details on how to earn the credit. Finally, if you enjoy listening to FP&A today, please go to your podcast platform of choice, click the subscribe button, and leave a rating and review of the show. And now, on to the show. From Data Rails, this is FP&A Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FP&A Today. We're going to talk about some best practice budgeting and forecasting. And a little bit of background, a year ago, around this time, the first LinkedIn Live we ever did for FP&A Today was on budgeting and forecasting. So the show's been going long enough that we've brought back a similar episode, and we even brought back one of the same guests. We swapped out a few, but we brought back Annette DeYoung, she was with us last year. We also have Andrew Childress and Alejandra with us. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves. Tell us just a little bit about yourself and what you're currently doing today. Let's see. We'll go ahead and start with Annette. Oh, boy. Um, so hello, everybody. Right, seeing a couple of episodes with, with the wonderful Paul here. Nice to see everybody. Um, so a little background for you. Um, I spent most of my career actually in finance and accounting, 23 years to be exact, uh, mostly in manufacturing in the Midwest until just shy of two years ago when I switched careers, had a little midlife crisis, decided <laughs> I didn't want to do budgeting and forecasting anymore. Um, and I actually worked for Data Real, so as a solutions consultant, the FP&A solutions consultant there. Um, absolutely loving it. Uh, never going to look back, but you know what? After a very long career in finance mm -hmm. and accounting, right, I do bring, right, obviously a wealth of uh, knowledge and experience so, to the new company. It's nice to see everybody. Thanks, Annette. Alejandra, if you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing. Yeah, sure, Paul. But if you let me, I will uh, start to tell you, telling you that I'm really glad to be sharing this panel with, with with you and these great colleagues to whom I've been listening in several podcasts and events. So really, thank you for the invite. Um, I am Alejandra, born and raised in Argentina and living in Spain. Um, right now, I am the fp &A manager in FASTA, which is a nonprofit organization that delivers education services across different countries, mainly in Latin America. So um, a little bit about the role that I am uh, currently in. Perhaps one thing that I can share is that it's been um, a really huge step to build the fp &A function within the financial department and make room to this kind of analysis and get this feeling that you really give the an insight that was needed to shift focus for, from um, risk mitigation or just reaction responses to making the department able to proactively seek for new growing opportunities. So that's one of the things that I love about this uh, FP&A position. Great, yeah, and, and building out FP&A can always be exciting and challenging at the same time. So yeah. th thanks for sharing that. Andrew, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're coming from. Yeah, thank you. So Andrew Childress, um, currently traveling full-time and uh, in Mexico currently. Um, one of the <laughs> things I love about what I do working for Data Rails as a solutions consultant is being able to travel full-time. but. Um, I don't want to sound like I stole Annette's bio too much, but very similar backgrounds, finance leadership, mostly in manufacturing companies and all of the things that come with that. Um, it's a lot of fun, but also some really unique challenges as well. Um, spent about 11 years in a combination of accounting and finance roles. And I think one of the things that's really amazing to see here is just the international audience that's joining us for this. And it makes me feel a little better that, that budgeting and forecasting is a challenge across the whole globe. So. Awesome to see everybody and excited to, to have this chat. Thanks, Andrew. And it definitely is. I mean, just in the time we've been chatting, we've had a number of other people mention where they're coming from. We got Ghana, Venezuela, Minnesota, Wisconsin. 
Yeah. All just all all over the world. Dubai, Sweden, Romania, South Africa, Colombia. So really great. Oman, and I could keep going, but we do have a show to get to. And where we're going to start with today is just before we get into the budgeting and forecasting questions, I would just like to start with a really basic question. And we'll throw this to Andrew. How do you define budgeting and forecasting? If someone was to ask you, you're at the dinner party, and someone's like, what is budgeting and forecasting? How are you going to define it? I'd probably try a different subject first, but if they pin me down, you know, and I had to come back to budgeting and forecasting. I mean, look, one of the things that I've thought my whole career is that really everything we build in terms of forward looking is about a story, right? It's a story that captures what the business thinks is going to happen. It, it is really your job and FP&A to facilitate those conversations between your business partners so that what you build up is a representation of where we think the business is going. And really having those drivers and capturing what's inside of that story is the texture of our business that helps us think about what we need to watch for, what the metrics need to be, how we need to operate the business from day to day. But at the end of the day, I think it really is about telling a story about what we collectively believe is going to happen in the business. Annette, anything you would add to that? Yeah, I'm I'm with Andrew at the first part. Run away, you know, change the subject. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, budgeting and forecasting, it's, it's, it's like, it's one of those, it's, it's a necessity. It's a, you know, it's an evil, you know, an evil necessity that every business has to do. Um, you know, if they really want to grow, if they want to continue, you know, cause you need a baseline. You kind of need to know, you know, where are we going to be next year? Like budget for that. Now we all know too, the moment you publish that budget, it's outdated. Right. That's what the, that's what the forecast is for. Now we get to reforecast, right? This is our initial thoughts because look at the world around us any day, any given day, it changes. And so you just got to be able to kind of figure out, you know, number one, where have you been? Absolutely that historical, but where are you going? Yeah. You know, and it's funny when you mentioned kind of a necessary evil, I was talking to somebody this morning, he joined a company in 2020 and the company had been around for almost 25 years and been dealing with 20 years of hyper growth. And he goes, we really didn't have defined budgets or forecasts. All of a sudden, we had to start figuring out how much are we spending because now they're starting to become a mature industry. And it was just kind of shocking because they're a, a global Fortune 500 company and had a very loose budgeting process, not something you see very often. Usually, they're pretty buttoned up. So it was kind of a fascinating conversation. And they were they were having to mature themselves quickly as they recognized uh, you know, the importance of being in an industry that no longer had hyper growth all the time. So it was really interesting. But uh, Alejandra, anything you would add to that of how you think of budgeting and forecasting? I think that um, I think of budgeting uh, as a way to get everybody on the same page. Because when you think about growing or moving forward, maybe everyone may have their own idea of what that means. And budgeting, it's like this simple uh, tool or roadway to put everybody on the same page and move forward at the same pace. So that's how I see it. Great. Thank you. So you know, why is it so important for companies to build a budget to forecast? I mean, what? why do they need to do it? Obviously, some companies uh, don't do it as often as they should. But Annette, why would you say it's so important? Um, I, again, I think too, right? You, you need to know where you're going. Historicals will only tell you where you've been. A good budget, number one, you can really see where right? Your profits are coming in where you're even your cost in that reforecasting again, as we see things changing in the world today, as we see, you know, inflation, as we see changes in the cost of everything from, you know, uh, you know, a small, you know, from your pen that you can use in the office to labor, everything fluctuates. And so, you know, you've got to make sure that you're in line, you're right, your revenues and your expenses are all in line. And so to kind of go in blind and not know, um, I mean, some companies are lucky, right? They get away with that, as you were saying, for, for quite a few years. And, you know, I would imagine that the first time they actually sat down into the budget, they were quite surprised what they found. Oh, yes. No, we've all <laughs> seen it where the budgeting process has been loose. And I'll use the term loose lightly. And you get in there and you start digging. You're like, wait, we're spending how much on this and that? And you start realizing 
why it's so important to budget, right? How many have ever done this where you look at how much you spent last month and you weren't budgeting and all of a sudden you're like, wait, I'm spending how much on what? <laughs> no different with the company, just on a much larger scale and bigger numbers. The and same thing is true. Go, it doesn't go noticed until cash flow becomes an issue. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right when cash flow becomes an issue, then everybody's like, "Whoa, where's all of our money going?" <laughs> right. So that's again, right? That's that forecasting. That's where it's so important. Is you know, yeah. obviously we talk about budget and forecast, and you know your financial statements, but if you're not on a, you know, but cash is king. No yep. cash, no business. So v- very true. When cash flow slows or revenue slows and all of a sudden you're not growing, then it's like expenses matter. It's amazing how high growth can hide a multitude of sins, but they can only do that for so long as the saying goes. So we had a couple questions here. And before we jump into our questions, I'm going to throw one of them up and just see if anyone's had experience with with this. I'll also share my thoughts. So one person just said, you'll kind of highlight more on budgeting and consultancy firms. What are your thoughts on the importance of budgeting and consulting firms? So I would say consulting firms are going to need to budget just like anyone else. There are definitely some challenges, you know, just like all firms of how you do it, right? Are you doing it based on historic run rates and how much you think each consultant will bring in for business? Are you basing it on what's in the pipeline? You know, how many people do you need to hire? But I think it's it's going to be similar to other businesses. It's just understanding what your key drivers are and then coming up with a method that makes sense. But I definitely think it's something you should do because without that budget, how do you know where you're going? How do you know if your expenses are in line? Any thoughts anyone would add to that? I'll throw that out to our panel. I don't know if any of you have worked in a consulting firm. I have not. Yeah, I think... You know, you, you really want to make sure that your utilization stays where it needs to, right? I, I've had some experience with something pretty similar to this. And it's really important, you know, if you want to grow the consulting practice, a big part of that is making sure that your, you know, your cost of employing that person versus what you're billing out the mm-hmm. client for stays in line, right? Because otherwise, you could really get into a situation where you still have high payroll costs, but don't have the billings to go with. And that that's where you can really hit a difficult spot. So The only way we know that is if we budget it and we keep our eye on those metrics. Yeah, no, definitely. You have to track utilization and understand billable hours and all those type of things. And a budget will help with that. So I hope that helped a little bit there. You know what it is like. 13 different spreadsheets emailed out to 23 different budget holders. Multiple iterations, version control, errors, back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. DataRails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. DataRails takes data from all of your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up to date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. So going into the, the next question, and we'll throw this one to Alejandra. For the budgeting process, you know, you've been through it a few times. Do you have a, a method you think works better or what's your thoughts? We always talk about top down, bottom up. How do you think about those approaches when it comes to budgeting? Yeah, I believe that the approach, it, it depends a little bit on which step of the process you are in, but also depends on the organizational culture in which you are planning, because it is not the same to be working in, in any kind, in any culture. So perhaps during the kickoff um, of the budgeting process, uh, I would prefer um, a top-down approach because I believe it gives you a clear goal and it's better for everybody to 
to align towards a common, yeah, to, to align every effort towards a common goal. And in the next steps of the process, I prefer um, a bottom-up approach in order to get better insight of the day-to-day -day operation. But um, in other steps of the budgeting process, perhaps I think it depends a lot more on the culture of the organization. And uh, to give an example, I can think that um, when you are talking about uh, shifting from one scenario to another, in, in my experience, that is a, a top-down decision, but I know there are other companies that, that approach that step of the budgeting process in a different way. Yeah, thank you. I know I agree. Uh, Annette, what is your thoughts on kind of bottoms up versus top down and how to manage those in the budgeting process? Yeah, and, and I have to agree with Alejandro, right? It's, it's, it's the culture too, right? So when I, I mean, I worked for companies where it really was top down. We got sales numbers and it was really finances job to push the budgets down to the owners, quote unquote. I'm going to use the, the word owners very loosely because they didn't have a say, yeah. right? They were fed a budget and then of course they're like, well, it's not my budget, right? Then you, then you <laughs> tend to not get a lot of ownership of said budget when it is truly a top down budget. Bottoms up, and, and, and I think that you can, you can really have both of those. So bottoms up, give them a say in what they want, right? Give them a say in uh, the budget process so that there are parts so that they own it. Once you have that, as we all know, it's always overblown. So now we have to do the top down that says, okay, we can't support the current budget as submitted. Now we need you to go back and edit, right? So it has to be collaborative if you're going to make that work for your company. So I think you have to have a blend of both of those. Yeah. And, and I tend to agree with you and we'll come to you in a second, Andrew, but I was going to say, you mean when, when you roll it all up and expenses grown by 10% and revenues grown by five, that doesn't work? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Everybody's laughing because we've all seen that kind of budget, right? When you let the business roll everything up, there's always more needs than you can fund. And yes. so I agree with you. It's really a combination. I tend to like to see something where you have the high level targets when you start, not at the end, but you tell the, the business, okay, you need to build a bottoms up of how you get there. And then often how they get there is too expensive. Then that's where the fun or the negotiation <laughs> begins of, Okay, do we take revenue down a little bit? Where can we shave expense? And it's almost yeah. always, no, no, leave revenue, but shave expense. And then you kind of have to explain, well, you're creating more and more risk if we do that, or that's not achievable. And Andrew, any thoughts or anything you'd add to this discussion? I think you all really hit all the key points. But for me, I think the only thing I'd add is, you know, I think FP&A's job is to help be that bridge between top down and bottom up, like truly driving how those two ideas meet. Because if you think about it in extremes, if I run a pure top-down approach, I get no organizational buy-in and now people can't go execute. And if I run pure bottoms up, stop me if you've seen this movie before, but the answer usually isn't what ownership and management wants, right? So <laughs> some <laughs> hybrid between the two where we decide, you know, guys, I'm hearing this from my VP GM. I think we need to be in this range and then pushing back and saying, look, these are the expense requests that the business has in order to support these targets. You can really kind of set yourself up to be that great connector between the functions. 100% agree. fp &A needs to be that connector for a couple of reasons. If you don't play that connector role and tell me, please comment if you've heard this before. I'm going to guess almost all of you, if you've been through a budget, can comment. You get into a meeting a couple of months later, and that's not my number. I don't recognize that number. That's finance's number. Anyone ever heard mm -hmm. that one before? I see all the panelists <laughs> nodding their head, and I'm yeah. going to guess a lot of the audience. Go ahead, Andrew. And, and one thing <laughs> I just add, too, is you can really tee up these conversations powerfully if you phrase them as conditionals, which is... If we're going to deliver 10 million in new revenue, the business is saying this is what's required to support it, whether it's these new product enhancements, these new salespeople, really build that bridge where you force that conversation and say, if this is what we are expected to deliver, this is what's needed. Yep, agree. So we have a question here. I'm going to go to a question before we continue on the list of questions we have. And one of them, there, there are two similar questions. Also, the first one, one asked how the budgeting works on startups. And then 
we had someone else. He said, I had the FP&A function in a startup. Could you please throw some light on a static annual budget versus a rolling power cast, which is more beneficial? We'll get to that, that question particularly in a minute. But just a little bit, I'll say with startups, you know, with startups, the budgeting process really starts with educating the team, taking them through why they need to do a budget, how you support them. And often there's not a lot of historicals. You're making a lot of assumptions. So it's really being a partner and being there to guide them and think through those, those first assumptions and building that first budget. Odds are as a startup, you're going to be further off than a mature business that you know, knows its growth rates and has been around for 50 years. And that's okay. It's really about thinking of how you should use resources and starting to think about, okay, where are we going to be in a year, two years? And as Annette said, especially with a small business, cash. It's about that burn and understanding what's happening with cash. And I'll throw this question out to the to our panel. Anything you guys would add to that as a startup? What should you really be thinking about as you're doing that budgeting? So um, I would say that uh, when you are budgeting in a startup, perhaps the focus should not be in being accurate or or being able to to guess where you are going to be next year. The focus should be on building a useful tool that will make you able to grow consistently during the next years. And and obviously, your budget will not be a uh, perfect in the sense that you will look backwards and you will say, yeah, we got it right. But um, <laughs> I would be really glad if it was a really useful way to make decisions, to allocate resources and to be a real partner to the business itself. I don't know. I love you said the linkage and be valuable to the business, help in making decisions, because that's really why we're planning, right? If you're planning to be right, and you can be right, then go bet on the stock market and retire early because you're in the wrong profession, <laughs> right? We want to be directionally correct. And are there areas we can be right? Like, okay, if they never hire anyone, we know they're going to be all there all year and we know their salary. We better be pretty close to accurate on that number. But in general, there's so many moving parts that it's about smart decisions, smart assumptions, and you know, building that model up to support the forecast, right? That's where someone asked kind of the linkage between forecasting and modeling. Really, you know, a model is a forecast. Whether it's a model for a budget, whether it's a model for a rolling forecast, whether it's a model for a capital investment, that's what, you know, a model is. A model is just a representation of what you think is going to happen. A budget happens one form of a model. A forecast is one form of a model. Often, sometimes multiple models, depending on the company size, all rolled up together. I'm reminded of the phrase, all models are wrong, some are useful. Yes, George Fox, one you, of my favorite yeah. quotes. And using it to guide, I, I love what Alejandro said about using it to guide the business. The point isn't to get it right. The point is to have something down that we measure ourselves against periodically and say what changes are needed. Yep, I, I agree. So, you know, obviously a lot of companies have kicked off the budgeting process. Some may still be doing it. We've all gone through that annual process. So, you know, what should finance be doing ahead of time so that they don't get into the annual chaos and up all night? You still may get there, but what are some things you can do to try to prevent that, to make the process go smoother? So those, you know, months ahead of the kickoff, what should we be thinking about? And we'll start this one with you, Andrew. So I think the number one thing you can do to get off to a good start is work backwards, right? So you've got owners, you've got stakeholders that have maybe due dates in mind for when they need to see that finished budget. And I think when you think about it like that, setting up a planning calendar that locks in those key milestones is really helpful so that you can kind of trend towards finishing it up. There's no mad rush at the end. And then circulating and socializing that calendar within your business partners is really helpful to know where their inputs will be required. So I think, again, setting the expectations early, having that budgeting kickoff session with your business partners to say, this is the journey we're going on. This is what's important. And here's how we'll collaborate with you so that they feel aligned to the planning process. You know, the communication thing, there's just, there's no such thing as too much communication when it comes to planning. And 
I think leading off with those kickoff sessions and calendars really sets the tone strong. I love one thing you said in there. There really isn't such a thing as too much communication. And I agree. You're always better off over communicating than under communicating for sure. Alejandro, what's your thoughts? What are some things do you find finance can do ahead of time that makes the process go smoother? Yeah, I think one thing you know, one thing that you can do to to get ahead of the process is to go over the tools that you've been using for the last years and try to think um which of them are are still useful and and which features perhaps has no longer use. So uh, I do this little exercise to 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 uh, look again at the last budget that I've been working in. And if I find some piece of information that has been not used during the whole year, perhaps a chart, a detail, or um, anything in which you will you have been spending a lot of time and effort to get it, but was not relevant in the decision making process. So I would just uh, rethink it because if it is not relevant, perhaps you can find ways to aggregate that information into a broader category and and just focus your time and resources in, in other in other aspects. And the same exercise would be like looking at the uh, actual strategic plan and see if there is anything new there that should be taken into account in your next budget. Perhaps there is a new corporate policy or perhaps there is a new project that you need to take into consideration specifically in your new budget and then uh, make room for that. Um, but last week I had an interesting conversation with a friend of mine. He is a plan manager in, in the United Kingdom. And he told me that he hated when from finance, we changed it the way that they had to budget from one year to the other. So I started <laughs> thinking about that again. So that would be my, my advice, but I had to address for that, uh, for that comment too. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you make a lot of great points. One, you know, review what you should add to the process, what you shouldn't. I think it's always good to review it at the end of the year, see how it went, make those changes, but try not to reinvent the whole process. So every year they never know what they're going to get. And I've seen that, especially sometimes when you're dealing, dealing it all in Excel and all manual and you have turnover and the new person comes in and I like this file or I like that file. And, you know, the business is like, all right, I have no idea how to fill this form out. It's completely different than last year. Help me here. And I see everybody smiling. I know everybody can relate to that one. So we're going to move on to the next question here. And we're going to start with you on this one, Annette. This is a fun one. How do you ensure that the financial plan, she's smiling already, is aligned <laughs> with the operational plan? You know, the finance and business are on the same page. How do you make sure there's that alignment? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, uh, communication. No, but no, communication, right? So, you know, you get sign-up meetings. As long as you've got that open communication, and I've done that throughout my career, you know, where are sales going? Okay, let's get operations. Everybody has to be in the same room, and they all have to have the same voice, right? So... A lot of times you get where, you know, operations is doing something and sales is doing something else. And that's where you create like that gap. So really it's our job to get everybody in the room to talk, right? Where is, you know, where are our revenues going, you know, for the next, you know, even if it's just the next two to three months, right? In operations, you know, how can you meet this demand or pull back again? But when you've got, you know, one hand doesn't know what the other one's doing, that's where you have a lot of those issues because operations doesn't know any better. They're just going to run whatever it is, right, that they're told to do. And so I just think getting everybody together, making sure that everybody has a voice in the future of the business and their strategic partners, not just, right, I just do this or I just do this, right? Everything that you do really has to be for the benefit of the company as a whole. I really like something you said there, you know, beyond obviously the communicate. But, you know, that strategic partner and everybody has to be in it together because I've definitely seen times where people are kind of disconnected and they feel like they're just given a number and you're not going to be aligned when that's the case. That's a great point there. Alejandra, any thoughts from you on this question? Yeah, I think I uh, covered it up pretty well. 
So I would only emphasize, I like what she says, because communication needs to go both ways. So I think that from the financial department, we just need to also figure out ways, not, on, not only to be clear enough, but also to learn how to listen and, and search of, the, of which, which are those things that we can do to make those plans, to be aligned and not just sit back and wait for everybody else to align their, their themselves to our financial plan. So that would be, that would be it. Thanks. I appreciate that. Great, great points there from both of you. Thank you. So I'm going to go back to a question we had earlier, and then we'll go back to list of questions we had here. And I'm going to send this over your way, Andrew. So, you know, Sheetal here mentioned she's working for a startup and just ask, can you throw some light on a static annual budget versus a rolling forecast? So maybe I, I'll start with, can you, can you explain for our audience the difference? And then from your perspective, is it, a, is it an either or question or should you have both? Or how do you think about it? Yeah, it is a great question. Um, so just, I guess, for background, you know, the way that I think about these two kind of approaches is an annual budget is once a year, you sit down with the business and your leadership and you lay out what the future should be. And you come up with ideally, you know, three statement model that says, here's where we're going to be for our next calendar or fiscal year. Right. And so then you measure yourself against that throughout the entirety of that period. Whereas a rolling forecast, typically what you're going to do is periodically you're going to update your forecast for the next X periods. So many companies will use an 18-month rolling forecast that every month or every quarter they're dusting off and saying, this is what the next period of time looks like. So which of those two is better? Um, I would say both and neither. Um, each of them have their uses. Each of them have their you know, pluses and minuses. I think for large organizations, you're typically going to see that annual budget. A lot of that, in my view, has to do with compensation and how people are measured against targets, right? So you have that locked-in budget that you use for the entirety of the period. But I think it's really important to kind of think about the environment that you're in and what would work best for your environment. I noticed that um, they mentioned that this is a startup. And I think in those types of environments, a rolling forecast can be really powerful. Um, most startups I've, I've worked for or been in, things are constantly changing. They're constantly in flux. The product that we're offering today is radically different than what we did a year ago. And I think the more dynamic you can be with your planning process, the more powerful it is so that you can continually iterate on it. Um, with that said, that requires having the staffing and the, um, the bandwidth to do so. So it can be a challenge to set that up. But I think really... If you can get to a rolling forecast for that type of fast moving environment, it's really powerful. Yep. And, and I'll just add one thing to that on my thoughts. I mean, I think they both have their power. They both have their place. And the reality is you can do both. They can go together. You can have an annual budget and then do a rolling forecast where you're looking out 12 months every time and you track to both. So it's not always an, an either or. They both have their places. And a lot of people like to have a frozen budget that no matter what changes, you don't have to have that. There's beyond budgeting. Uh, earlier episode of FP Day today, we had a guy by the name of Bjorn and he wrote a book on beyond budgeting. We had uh, another guy on from Chili Piper, Mikras, who uh, talked about how they didn't, they did away with the traditional budgeting process. So there are other options. It's a matter of figuring out what works best for you. And there are pros and cons to every one of these approaches. And we could spend a lot more time talking about them than we have in this hour, just on the pros and cons. Yeah. So I'll just give an opportunity, Annette or Alejandra, any thoughts you would add to that on budget, rolling forecast, that discussion there? Yeah. And I'm going to be really American in that I'm going to liken it to sports. Um, so <laughs> Think of it almost like you almost have to think of it like American football, right? Where the end zone, the goalpost, that's your budget, right? That never moves, but your players move on that field. Every down is a forecast. Every down is like you're just, you're really, your, your goal is to get to the end zone. That's kind of your budget, right? So every play kind of gets you directionally correct, right? At least going in the right <laughs> direction. But it can definitely change. You go forward, you go backwards, right, et cetera. But having a static budget, at least you have something to compare to as 
the year goes on, as the time goes on. And of course, you're going to compare that forecast to your budget too. Are you doing better or worse? So I think to your point, like they're both really necessary. And I don't think one's better than the other by any means. I think they both can live, um, you know, harmoniously together, uh, you know, with very few tackling, hopefully. So. All right. Thanks, Annette. Alejandra, anything you want to add to that discussion or? Yeah, I believe that uh, I agree with, with what you were saying. And and actually, in my experience, we use both mm, together. And, and that's the way that we find that they work be the best. So uh, when you are facing also uh, high levels of uncertainty, mm, perhaps right now, most of our operations are in countries that are facing uh, high rates of inflation between 100 to 100 percent. So uh, in that matter, we we find that having a, a clear budget um, is really appreciated because with inflation comes confusion and you need something <laughs> to tell you which is the direction you need to be leading on. But also uh, the, the, the forecast is what gives you the flexibility to choose different paths in order to achieve the goal. So I agree with you, and especially uh, either because you are in a startup that itself it's a business with a lot of changes, or you are in a mature industry but in a really uncertain mar market, I believe that these two tools are really important to move forward. Great point. So I'm going to just share a couple comments we got, you know, we have here. Carolina, in my opinion, it's still necessary to freeze one version of the rolling forecast, kind of what Annette was talking about, the goalpost to be used as comparison. You know, for all other matters, rolling forecasts work wonderfully. So there's one opinion. Another, an org I used to support would say the original budget was strategic and the updates rolling were tactical, right? And so there's a lot of different ways to think of it. Everybody's going to have different, different opinions. What we're going to move on to here is a little bit about scenario planning. And so I'm going to throw a question out to our audience. And if you guys just can throw in the chat, how many of you are doing scenario planning today? I know that number has grown over the last couple of years, as it feels like every time we turn around, the world turns upside down. There's an energy crisis, inflation, a crisis abroad, a global pandemic. I'm sure I'm missing 10 or 12 other things that we could throw in there. Uh, interest <laughs> rates going up, right? All, all those type of things. So it's really scenario planning has become much more important. And I'd love to just get all of your thoughts on what advice you could offer around scenario planning. How should people think about it? Maybe how have you used it in your businesses and in your processes? So why don't we start with you on this one, Annette? Yeah, uh, best case, worst case and reality. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, honestly, that's, you know, that's kind of been the way that I've always done scenario planning is really those three best case. We're actually going to do what the sales team says we're going to do. There's my best case, right? We're going to roll it back <laughs> a little bit to reality. And then again, we look at what's kind of going on in the world. And then we have to do a worst case. What if, you know, for instance, what if we lose our top customer, right? Those types of things, you have to think about that, right? There's a lot of competition out there, regardless of what industry you're in, you know, so you always have to have, okay, worst case, if this happens, this is where we need to pivot as a business, where, where we need to cut costs. And you have to have a plan in place for that, right? Best case, we all hope for that, right? But you, you, I've always just kind of done those three different scenarios that really any company I've ever worked for. I, I think that's great. And I had on, an episode, uh, Shruti Lanka, she's the CFO of public.com. And she mentioned her worst case, what she always does is strip out everything, but only the guaranteed revenue, only things we have contracts for and say, okay, what does my profile look like in this situation? How long can I survive? What's my cash like? And then she builds up from there to the other scenarios. So now I have kind of that doomsday scenario, so to speak. And at least I know, okay, if that happens, here are my options and I can build from there. So I think it's similar to what you're saying, Annette. There's a lot of different ways to look at it. And yes, often, depending on what kind of sales leader you have, the optimistic is the sales team. Or if they're really good at sandbagging, and I've had a few, then your <laughs> pessimistic is the sales team. Then you have to go back to them and say, no, I know you have this, this, and this. Like I one time had a salesperson who, I think they put in a number for a, 
big supplier of like 600,000 and it ended up being 11 million for the year. <sighs> like, well, it was an uncertain. We didn't know where the contract would end up. And the head of sales was just like, are you kidding me? Like you put that number in. So yeah, I've seen some definite sandbagging before, but we'll go to you, Alejandro. What's your thoughts around scenario planning? Yeah, I, I believe that scenario planning in itself is like really great fun, even interesting, but you need to be careful not to overwhelm the whole system and to keep it relevant. So I agree with Annette to identify only like a, a few and impactful uh, situations and try to um, think of the reaction to those. And for me, it is also very important to to be very clear of uh, which is the shifting point with from one to the other, who's going to take that decision and how is that going to be communicated to the rest of the organization? Because uh, in this it is, um, scenario planning can be very interesting, but can be um, not so effective if you don't have like this criteria really uh, well established among the, the whole company. And another thing that perhaps I... I have been thinking about the last few years was if it is uh, useful to plan for like a black swan scenario. I know it's kind of paradox because you, you don't know what a black swan event can look like, mm -hmm. but I know that you can identify which is the key driver of your business and just try to think what a shock to that would look like. Um, and, and outline which will the course of action be in that matter. Yeah, I, I love two points you made there that really stuck out to me. One, I agree with the black swan. We don't know the details of a black swan, but they happen every so often. And you can still plan at a high level for one. And then the second thing that I really like that you talked about is not going overboard and making sure it's actionable. Okay, if I got the scenario, if like you have a scenario that says, what are we going to do in a recession? Then you also need to go, okay, when do we start implementing that plan that goes with the scenario? Because often we just build the scenarios and then we take the middle and forget all about it. And that's not really scenario planning. That's just extra work. If you don't really think about what's the steps we're going to take if situation A, B, or C happens, that's where the real benefit can come because that puts you ahead of the curve and you start to see the trends. You can say, okay, we already know what we're going to do. And you could start to prepare yourself, whether that be a growth phase, whether that be contraction, whatever it might be from that scenario. So I really like that you pointed that out because I think sometimes we forget about that part, really, that there, each of those scenario plans need to have those actions with them. It's not enough to just put a number on the board and be like, all right, we got our number. We can move on now. Yeah, you know, I think going back to the original question of why is scenario planning important to me, it's to make your budget more useful, make your plan more useful, because how many times have we had a significant event that radically changes the outlook for the business? And then we tear up the budget and stop using it as a measuring stick, right? So <laughs> alternatively, if you have some flexibility and some scenarios built into your budget, you're basically making it a much more useful output. And yeah, I really like what Alejandra said about you know the black swan events, because even though we don't know what they are by nature, we still need to have plans for whatever our scenarios include. So many FP&A professionals will get overwhelmed about what to forecast as a scenario, when in reality, you don't have to know the specifics. You just have to know, if my COGS shoots up 10%, what will be the actions I take as a result? You don't have to have the individual drivers or actions named, you're looking for those heuristics that say, when this trigger point happens, here's the action we'll take. And I think that's a really good point. You don't have to have the details of exactly everything that's going to happen in a scenario or even what triggered it per se. But if certain things happen, how are you going to respond? So I really like that. I think that that's a good point there. Um, I like what uh, Adi says here about black swans, swans. I'll just throw this up there. When those black swan events happen, I've seen effective managers push to find the bottom and plan accordingly. And I think that's a good mm. point. You try to figure out what's the worst case and you know, kind of figure out from there. Ho hopefully you've already done that in a scenario, but yes, you need to do that. I mean, how many of us, I know from, I'll raise my hand, our budgets were blown 
oh, about end of March, 2020. Did anyone have a budget that was still any good? Right. I know <laughs> mine was completely shot and we were reforecasting and reforecasting and reforecasting again. So, you know, having thought through that can really save you a lot of time. So going to the next question here. So we've talked about scenario planning. We've talked a little bit about budget and thinking about that. How do each of you think about forecasting throughout the year? And have you found an approach that you think works best for that? And um, Andrew, we'll go ahead and start with you on this one. Yeah, it's actually, I think, a really good overlap with what we were talking about, about budget and rolling forecasts, that if you can get to a place where you're always forecasting and then simply carve out a period of time and make that your budget. So that can really be an effective process. But You know, again, just like we've been chatting about, the budget is that goalpost that you need to have to always have that annual measuring stick, right? Really the goalpost analogy that Annette gave us. But the forecast is that ongoing continuous story of what we see is happening. So, you know, again, good business partnership and and looking ahead to the future is about frequently revisiting it and constantly updating what our outlook is. And I think that is the role of the forecast is to manage, measure, and message what we're going to do um, in the near term. And any thoughts on how often it should be done? Have you had you know best practice or do you find it varies from company to company? What's your thoughts on how often you should be reforecasting? You know, I think I've been different places that handled it differently. Some would do an ad hoc when changes are needed. Others were in a you know robust every month forecast process. Um, I think you need to decide how often the fundamentals of your business are shifting such that you need to create a new forecast. So if you have a very interest rate sensitive business or, you know, oil price sensitive business, this is where you're probably touching it and, and keeping it updated pretty often versus if you don't have, you know, constantly shifting things, let's do a quarterly forecast and focus on running the business instead. So I think you really have to assess the environment you're in to know what's right for you. Uh, great point there. And I really like something you said. Let's uh, focus on running the business versus reforecasting again. And it's a balance. I can see Annette and Alejandro both smiling on that one because I'm sure they've probably been on both sides of that that equation. So we'll go to Annette and then we'll go to Alejandro. Any thoughts on this, Annette? Yeah. And and I agree with Andrew. And, and when you think about forecasting too, um, don't do forecasting for the sake of doing forecasting. <laughs> Honestly. I, I mean... Yes, thank you. It's, I've had jobs where it, you reforecast every single month with very little change, but the amount of, of labor that you have to put into that, especially when you're working with just Excel and your systems, right? And so really just the amount of like, uh, you know, it, 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 keeps, it can get emotional sometimes, right? Because you're literally reforecasting with very few changes, but you're doing this process. You're almost doing a full budget process month after month after month after month without really seeing the benefit of it. So to your point, right, what are your key drivers? If it's volatile, absolutely, you should be reforecasting more often. If it's not a quarterly free forecast, and even sometimes, you know, once, you know, do your six plus six, see where you're at, you know, half of the year, you know, reforecast and then move on. So it, it really just does depend, right? What is the company? What are the key metrics and how often do they fluctuate? Because I think we've all been there where we just did forecasting for the sake of doing forecasting and it doesn't really benefit anybody. Um, It really just burns you out. Yeah, I had a place where we did it eight times a year. We did it everything but quarter close and we had to forecast the current year plus 36 months out. And it was was not fun. I I think I've been on both sides of that. Alejandro, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, we used to forecast uh, quarterly, but since last year, due to the inflation rates and the scenario and the and the context context that I was telling you before, we decided to forecast every month. And although it is a lot of work, we believe that it was the right decision because so long we are being able to stay on top of the situation. But also, we we decided. Um, to simplify the process as much as we could. So we are really reforecasting, I I don't know, like six or seven lines of of our budget Mm -hmm. every month. And we are doing that process in in a bottom-up approach. 
and trying to, to consume as less effort as possible. But it is also given everybody this, this sense of security or safety or something that, that makes them feel that we are still uh, on the good track. So, so long it's been a good experience and, and we will, we will see how it goes in the next months. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. You know, I worked at a large Fortune 500 company and we switched from doing, we did a quarterly forecast. We went to a monthly risk and opportunity process where we forecasted everything at a high level. They built out the system where we just loaded it, no longer worrying about every cost center and all the details. And I found that worked well for us. It freed up time. And I've implemented that in another company I went to. And funny thing, we weren't doing any regular forecasting. So I implemented it. We got it all in place with my regional CFO. And then the global CFO said, we want you to do a full forecast every month. I'm glad I spent three months on that process. But that's how it works sometimes. <laughs> but I've always found that worked well as a good balance where you're looking at things regularly and understanding you know, what's going on and making sure you're focusing on those six or seven key things, but you're not forecasting for the sake of forecasting. You're getting into every single detail. So I think the big thing here is you need to forecast periodically. It's going to depend on your metrics, how your business changes, and there is no right method. It might be some areas you might be forecasting weekly. Some you might be forecasting twice a year. Some you might be doing an R&O. Some you might be doing a rolling. There are best practices and there are people you can talk to and things you should think about. But there is no right answer for forecasting or for budgeting. If there was, we'd give it to you. But we don't have any uh, secrets that just magically make the process happen. If I did, I'd be selling it to y'all. No, I'm just kidding. So... <laughs> You know, we're coming up near the end of our time. We just have a couple more questions left. If anyone has any questions in the chat, you know, please feel free to put those in the comments. But this next question is going to be a little bit around technology. Now, this is an area where obviously we've seen a lot of change, but we all know the dominant tool for planning. And if I ask the people in the audience, how many are using a spreadsheet to plan? Overwhelmingly, I'd guess that's, I would guess that's the answer. But how should you think about technology and and tech stack in the budgeting and planning process? Like, you know, what role does it play? Maybe what are some of your thoughts? And on this one, we'll start with you, Alejandra. How do you think about technology to help you with budgeting and forecasting? I believe it is uh, really helpful. And it's also, uh, depending on the size of the organization, quite a challenge to get passed through Excel. And uh, an excellent and perhaps uh, implementing some um, BI tools like Power BI or something like that. But when when we are uh, thinking of moving perhaps to a specific software or something like that, I personally have no experience because when we assessed that matter, we we really thought that it was uh, not the right fit for our organization. Sure. And and also um, implementing and, and moving forward with technology. One of the things that I believe it, it really in, enriches the FPNA function is that all the flexibility about reporting and visualization tools helps you tell you uh, tell a better story and, and communicate better with your stakeholders. So. I, I believe that one of the great advantages of technology is also to smooth communication across the whole company, um, besides be freeing you up time to, to do better analysis and, and stuff. Thank you. I, yeah, it's different for each company, you know, what you should put in place and if you need a tool and when you need it. And so I appreciate your thoughts there. Andrew, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think that the right way to think about it for teams is to start off by assessing what you want to accomplish with your planning process, right? What level of detail do I need to deliver? How involved do my stakeholders need to be? How often do I need to do it? Get that process in place, even if you're seeing that it's running a little slow without a tool in place, and then assess what are the gaps and how I'm planning today. Do I need to be able to go faster? Do I need to be able to bring collaborators into the budget process, even if uh, outside of Excel with a tool and a platform and start 
you know, push the limits of what you're doing and then figure out where you need the help before you just go out and buy a planning tool for the sake <laughs> of buying a planning tool, right? And I think, again, it goes to getting your process in place and really getting that down pat and then figuring out where tools can come along in the process. Kind of like buying a car without thinking about what kind of car, what you need to use it for. And then a month later, you're like, why did I do this? And you have a nice big purchase on your hands. So I think you make a great point of really going through the assessment and thinking about what you need. Annette, any thoughts you would add to this question? Yeah, I would honestly say that finance is probably the last department that gets funded for tech. Um <laughs> I, I mean, mm-hmm. honestly, and especially in manufacturing, there are so many other areas where the company is willing to invest and spend money. Sure. Finance traditionally isn't one of those. For the most part, because we've learned to manage with the tools that we have, right? They're still getting their reports. They're still getting the metrics that they need, despite the fact that we work 60, 70 hours a week, right? But we're getting the job done. We find a way to do it. And so when you do finally get to that point where you're like, I, you know, I want time to myself. I want a better process. You know, I, I can't make this any better than I have it today, right? Without now bringing in something else. That's where you, you're, you know, then you have to sell it to management, right? This is why we need it. Again, it's that, well, you always give me what I need. Yes, but they don't understand the human capital behind it. <laughs> and so that's where I think a lot of times finance is really the the last department, really, you know, within a business that gets funded for these types of things. But yeah, so you get to the point, and I think we've all been to that point. Not we were like, I just can't do it like this anymore. There's got to be an easier way, right? <laughs> yes, all of us. And you know, and and for those of you who know me, you know, I learned SQL. I learned, you know, I learned how to write VBA. I'm like, I learned as much as I could to make my job easier. But there comes a breaking point. Not just your sanity, but your Excel, right? I always joke that I I work with coworkers Al and Frank. That stands for Albatross and Frankenstein. And we have those coworkers, and those are Excel spreadsheets that we use today. Right. They started out a simple process and we keep adding and adding and adding until it's 20 megs. Right. You have to turn off auto calculation in order to make any kind of change because otherwise it just eats up all the memory on your computer. So yes, there will come a time when you're going to need technology. Right. And I would say plan for it sooner than later so that you don't get to the breaking point before you finally, you know, get to where I need something. Plan for that because Technology is moving, and I really believe that you know the sooner you can adapt that, you're going to be much further ahead than your competitors. Thank you, Annette. Appreciate that. And so, moving on to our last question here, we just have a couple minutes left. This is one we ask pretty much in every episode. So it's, what is your favorite thing about Excel? It could be feature or function. And we'll start with Andrew here. Yeah, definitely for me, hands down, it's Power Query. Um, you know, I think being a little bit lazy in life is a good thing. You go searching for faster and easier ways to do things. And I think, you know, the power to automate, you know, the data pipeline and, and cleaning it up and getting it into my reports and analysis is probably the number one thing that shifted my career and freed me up to do more analysis work. So just a big fan of, of, uh, of that feature just to, because of the time it gives you back to do all the fun stuff. Love me some Power Query. It's one of my uh, favorite courses to train people on because the light bulb goes on when they see what they can do. Annette, how about you? Yeah, not necessarily a feature or a function, but the overall flexibility of Excel. You can literally do anything in (laughs) Excel. Literally anything you want to do. And we're talking outside of math, right? Outside of the numbers. I've used Excel for so many non-financial you know, things that I've had to do over my career. Um, and, and even personally, I use it as design software when I'm trying to right, create something. So I just think the overall flexibility and the fact that you can make it do and look however you need to. Yeah, no, that's that's a good one. Thank you, Annette. Alejandro, how about you? What's your uh, favorite thing? Okay, so the things that I use most perhaps are like, pivot tables or VLOOKUP, and I still find them find them really useful. And I also love 
um, macros and started in, in investigating a little bit on BPA and and starting to get the hang of that. And that's really a new a new world for me. So I would go with that. Great. So there's a, a few different ones we had there from our audience, and there's so many different things. Flexibility is great in Excel. Thank you, Annette, Alejandra, and Andrew for joining us for this session. Really appreciate it. So if anyone from the audience wants to reach out, you can find each of them on LinkedIn and contact them there if you want. I'm sure they'll be happy to answer your questions. And thank you for, for joining us. If it wasn't for you, the audience, we wouldn't be successful. So thank you. 